It is your authority on goaltending, whether it's sensorina and training aids, on ice instruction, or great interviews. It is In Goal Radio, the podcast with the co owners, the co inventors, the co creators of In Goal Magazine, David Hutchison and Kevin Whitley. Know this I changed the order of the co creators, the co inventors, the co owners of In Goal Magazine every time. Sometimes it's Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison, sometimes it's David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley because it's a 50 50 thing. And I don't know who was the driver behind it. So I want to make sure that you guys are both represented equal. I know that I go last. Thank you very much for joining me, you guys. Well, you're first here always. You, you you are always <laughs> first. And for the record, I hadn't noticed that you alternate, but it should always be Hutch. I hadn't either. Because H- no. Hutch is the founder. He is the he is he is the grandfather of this operation. That that's how I like to refer it. Well, I bought the lot, but you built the house, so we're definitely in it together. Oh, that's a good wow, way to look put at that it. That's a strong you analogy game. Okay. Thank you. We're going to get into the draft. We're going to get into unrestricted free agency. We have a great feature interview brought to you by Sense Arena uh, coming up uh, with Nicholas Backstrom. And, of course, our gear segment uh, presented by The Hockey Shop, Source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Uh, Source for Sports is such a great uh, partner of ours uh, on Ingle Radio, the podcast. But uh, on the subject of founder, what's the oldest thing that you have from Ingle? Whether it's a sticker, whether it's a piece of paper, uh, some type of gear that uh, that was stitched in with in goal on it, what's the earliest or oldest piece of paraphernalia? I had some. It's not very exciting. I had some some gift cards, not gift cards, but just sort of greeting card cards made up that you would use to send a note in the mail or whatever, and some envelopes. Yeah. So those were done pre Woody. Um, I get, you could almost even just say the logo itself, which was done so long ago. I can't remember the name of the goaltender who did it for us, but, um, from Pittsburgh, I'm going to look this up for next week so that I can actually give credit where credit is due. So the logo itself, and then, then these cards so that, um, we, we use them for a while when we were selling the in goal stickers and stuff online. And I would use those to send a note to people who bought something. Um, not very exciting, but, uh. And then business cards and my helmet, actually, my, my mask, right? I think that was also done pre-Woody. And uh, so that's got the end goal logo on it, which is kind of fun. We got to we gotta be... Woody, what's your uh, oldest We got to be careful with the pre-Woody stuff. It'll sound like we're selling ED medication on here. Uh, um, <laughs> we're getting old. We are. We are. <laughs> I, I think mine is funny because as soon as you said, like, as you were struggling for words to describe the cards, I thought you meant, I thought yes. you meant business cards. I'm like, oh, they're called business cards, Hutch, but you meant, you, yeah, you meant something you. else. I do have, I, I do have a business card here. That would be my first thing. Um, and I got to say, considering that we are like, you're a design guy uh, who built the site and did when we used to have an actual like magazine PDF format with like really fancy layout. This business card, I have a bunch of them left over because the font was so small with my email, Twitter handle, and phone number that you need a magnifying glass to find it. So nice big logo, but pretty much useless beyond that. And it says... Knowing you, you probably designed that yourself because you wanted it. Probably, probably. Yeah. And it says Associated Press, USA Today, The Hockey News, um, none of whom I've written for now since switching to NHL.com. (laughs) <laughs> like 2012 so 11 years ago wow it, so so it's been a decade that's 11 years wow. ago at least these business cars are made so i do keep a few around um as a memory and that is my first <clears throat> in goal thing there we go how close does that business card have to get to your eyes for you to be able to read your email address well it's like one of those things that like it's i would have I sort of have like I'm in bifocal stage now of of old age. Oh, yeah. So like yeah, so I, I actually gonna, like have to. I'm better if I take my glasses off and then I can read it. Yeah, I do that grocery store all the time. Uh, I, I want to know from any lawyers who are on listening to the show, if you can't read the contract you're signing because the print is so small, is mm. it binding? I I may have just bought a car and I couldn't read anything. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> they just kept saying sign here. Sure. Oh yeah yeah yeah. They don't even wait for you to look at it. They don't give you a chance because they got five people out there waiting to come in and do the same thing. Yeah, that's how hot that business is. Uh, so, uh, a goaltender designed the in goal logo. I, 
was not aware of I that. I believe he was a goaltender. Yeah. It was That's a, cool. Yeah. And, and it's so long ago, but he had, I found him, I think, through Twitter and paid. Uh, he was paid for it, probably even more than the original Nike logo designer was paid. That's a legendary hmm. story. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to look it up. Was it Ken Reggett? It was not Ken Reggett. No, oh. not an NHL goaltender. Okay. I was thinking that would be Denny Heron. Uh, <laughs> hey, old, old, old Pittsburgh hey, goalies. Michel Plast, did he play in? Yeah. I hey, think. I hey, speaking know. of older goalies, we haven't gotten into the Hockey Hall of Fame decisions. Oh, there you go. Three guys. I was shocked. Three. I was shocked. Three. And, and, and it's an underrepresented area of the Hall of Fame, to be quite honest. Uh, with uh, less than 40 going into this year. And three guys go in one single class. And I talked to Darren Elliott, former Olympian and uh, former National Hockey League goaltender about this, because that sort of been his wheelhouse with uh, Tom Barrasso, with Mike Vernon, and, and then Henrik Lundqvist coming after. Like, who is Who is the best out of those guys? I know Henrik has the Vesna and some amazing totals and the appeal of New York and, and that resume, but Tommy Barrasso won a couple of cups and uh, sorry, Tommy Barrasso. Yeah. Won a couple of cups and, and a Vesna and a Calder and Mike Vernon won a, won a couple of cups. They, they're, they're pretty strong resumes on the other two guys. All deserving. I think there's a few other guys out there who, including one former podcast guest and Chris Osgood that we'd have on the list as well. Yes, we talked about that yeah, too. Um, for sure. I guess, see my bias, there's recency bias for me, right? Like didn't cover the game, didn't cover the position for sure with any degree of sort of attention during their eras like I did Henrik's. And to me, Henrik like, was the best goalie of his generation. So I guess for for you guys that, are older, just kidding. But for you guys that did cover those, and maybe this is a question for your friend Darren Elliott, was there a point where, like, somewhat inarguably, Mike Vernon and Tom Barrasso were the best goaltender of, 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 of a decade long period? Well, Vernon went to two finals uh, against the Edmonton Oilers, like when he was head to head with the Edmonton Oilers, got through the, that, that, that track. So I, I think that that uh, gives him. Great stock and Tom Barrasso, yeah, he, for a long period of time, maybe not, but what he did from high school right to the pros and and, and then winning cups. Like I, I honestly believe his relationship with the media held his induction back. That's the only reason why 100%. It, it it took so long. Uh, his his game, his production, his resume, it, it's Hall of Fame worthy without a doubt. No. I, I, no, no, I, I completely agree and was going to say just on the flip side, you know, Henrik Lundqvist, such a likable, open guy that yeah. everybody enjoys being around, plus sort of recency bias there as well. Like, yeah, I've just got great memories of Tom Barrasso as a goaltender. And as you say, like how many guys um, think about the NHL draft, which just happened, you know, over the last couple of days. Imagine one of those kids that was chosen out of a U.S. high school stepping in as a starting goaltender and winning the Calder Trophy in, September, in the Vesna. This, this, yeah, yeah, this coming season. Yeah. Like, remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. I think we should just... We, and then going on and, and winning the Cups on, on top. Yeah, no, no, yeah, the record speaks for itself. It's, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's an incredible record, I think. And I, <laughs> Henrik Lundqvist, I've got massive, like, great feelings for, but there were a lot of great goaltenders through that that period too, Woody. I mean, yeah, no, no. Like, yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of guys might argue that was he the best of the ten years. I'm, I'm not saying he wasn't, but, but there's a lot of great it, goalies in that period. It's a short list. Luongo was in that conversation. Yeah. He went in as a first ballot guy. At the end of the day, I think as the as official representatives of the goalie union, rather than pick nits and try to figure out who's more mm -hmm. deserving of what, let's just celebrate the fact that more guys got in from the position. Because as Darren said at the top of this discussion. It is underrepresented at the Hall of Fame. Hopefully this bodes for sure. well for Osgood, for Curtis Joseph, guys who are in the top 10 of wins all time to be a part of the Hall of Fame in the future. And for God's sake. I was about to, I was about to bait you. Here we with go. With three guys in, could we not have just 
made it a clean sweep and finally inducted a freaking goalie coach? Like, can we not get there? Um, you know, like, I, you I think keep that saying that Larry's the, the first years. one. I don't know. Maybe we need to start banging the drum harder. I don't know what the deal is. I, I think it does, Darren. Um, because in addition to Francois is the obvious first choice, and you could make an argument, um, you know, post posthumously uh, for Warren Strela, who just got into the USA yeah. Hockey Hall of Fame as well as sort of one of those pioneers for the position, both in terms of goalie coaching being a, a specialty area, but also opening it up to not just been there, done that guys that had played the game, making it a science. Um, you know, Strelo, Alaire, but like builders don't have to be retired. Right. Like you don't have to quit building to be in the elected into the Hall of Fame as a builder. You can still be active. So Mitch Korn, you know, we just watched Henrik Lundqvist go in. Who's who's followed him in New York? Igor Shesterkin. At what point do we start to talk about Benoit Lair and the legacy he's built with the Rangers? The success he had, you know, with with Arizona before that. Guys like Sean Burke, who just won a Stanley Cup yeah. as a goaltending director and goaltending coach. And and the principles that he reinvented his career under, under Ben Lawler. It's not just, you know, we talked about success and records and accolades and cups. And for sure, like Francois has the cups too, but it's about legacy on the game, changing the game, changing the position. And there's a lot of guys on that list, on the goalie coaching list that I just mentioned, that changed the position. Ian Clark, you know, who we have at ingolmag.com this week. Make sure you check it out. You talk about the hockey shop, Source for Sports as our featured sponsor. Um, the hockey shop source for sports at Tendy Fest. Ian Clark was our featured guest for a Q&A. There's a 50-minute interview video live up at ingoldmag.com. He's a name that should be on that list, but it probably needs to start, I believe, with a lair. And I'm with you, Darren. I'm hoping it happens in the next 10 years. You know, but the last time I talked to somebody on that committee that had a vote, doesn't anymore, but had a vote and asked that question of them, the response was, well, he's an assistant coach and we've never even thought to consider assistant coaches. And I think that needs to change because especially not just changing the position, Francois Allaire changed the game. Like Butterfly, like the way he taught Butterfly and the way he made it systematic, like everything around goaltending had to change, how you beat goaltenders, how you, like he changed the game in so many ways. And I, you know, equipment evolutions tied to him um, through his relationship with CCM and the Lefebvre's. I just like it's just such a no brainer. We've written the story many times. The quotes just keep getting piled up. I, I don't understand why it's taken so long. Good well, week to go he, back to episode 100 and listen to that one. The uh, the idea of all three guys, Bernie and Barrasso and Henrik, if at the end of all their speeches, they say, hey, it'd be great to have a goalie coach in here or them drop that they one after the other, after the other, nothing will get the voters, the selection committee's attention more than something like that. And I don't want anybody to think that I was uh, uh, trying to nitpick on Henrik Lundqvist. I was more building up the other two. Uh, Barrasso's resume and and Mike Vernon and what they did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and, and as far as those guys delivering that message... I think there were a lot of people that thought maybe it would get delivered last year with Roberto Luongo and his ties to Francois Allaire. Mm-hmm. Like he's one of the guys quoted in our story, like, you know, that like Francois Allaire is the most impactful goaltending coach he had in his life. Um, but Roberto's just, he's not that way, right? Like he's much like here in Vancouver, they're putting him in the ring of honor instead of retiring his jersey, which is frankly absurd to me and absurd to most fans. But Roberto's not going to make waves about it, right? Like just, he's not going to, so... He's honored by the Hockey Hall of Fame to be in. He's not going to make waves by saying, great that I'm in, but we need to have a goalie coach in too, and Francois Allaire should be first. Hendrik Lundqvist might put that in a speech, but here's, here's the question. Tommy Barrasso, well, Barrasso was a goalie coach for a while after in, Car- in Carolina. Yeah, I bet he, mm-hmm. wouldn't, he wouldn't mind making well, waves. I know he wouldn't That'd mind making waves, <laughs> but my question is, how much goaltending coaching did Barrasso and Mike Vernon, maybe we got to get them on to ask them because it was a different era. Goalie coaching was, you know, at times non-existent back then. I'd be curious to hear what their opinions are of it and and how much, if any, impact it had on them because they were playing at a time when it was not an every team had it type of position. Uh, before we get to uh, some of the news from this week, uh, just a shout out as we bask in the glow of the hockey shop and Tendi Fest uh, in the 
wake of what happened there, what's happening over at uh, the Hockey Shop source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com? Pretty much on a daily basis, there is new stuff coming in. It is that time of year. It used to be this was an April thing. You know, new products would launch all the time. Well, it's, it's June 30th. We're on the eve of free agency in the National Hockey League. And we're on a launch day for Bauer's GSX line, as well as the new Bauer Connect, the second price point. They brought in, a you know, basically get the Connect style skate in a lower price point. They've both launched. They're both at the hockey shop and at thehockeyshop.com. We've got our review with Cam today talking about the GSX, GSX line, uh, which is their sort of entry level price point. Uh, for pads, great for kids, but also beginners at older levels as well. Uh, it's a product we've had a lot of questions about uh, in the feedback channels on YouTube over the past month. People ask us, when are you going to do the GSX line? When are you going to do the GSX line? Well, we've had this interview in the can because Cam, Cam has had it in the store for a while, but we're finally able to share it with the rest of you. Let's catch up with Cam and the Bauer GSX line. I can't believe I got that out without stumbling. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop, Source for Sports. We're over here in Cam's Crease, Cam's Corner, Goal Utopia, surrounded by, like seriously, all the latest and greatest. All the new stuff is coming in. We've been rolling it out over the past couple of weeks. Uh, talked about the Hyperlite 2 line, talked about the Bauer X5 Pro, and today we have a rocket ship. <laughs> the new GSX line. Redesigned GSX line. From Bauer, fresh and hot for 2023. There's a lot of major upgrades that this gear has gone through. And pretty close, going on a bit of a limb here, probably one of the best, if not the best, junior pad ever seen come through the shop. Oh, that explains why this glove is so itty bitty. I was kind of like, did you bring it out for Hutch's hands? Just kidding, Hutch, I love you, buddy. But you do have small hands. Got, got him. Or maybe there's another social media person that likes small gear. I don't know. Just kidding, guys. I tease because I love. So this, okay, so ironically enough, I was holding the senior pad too. So we, like, you know, why don't we start off with the junior stuff because you're already holding the glove. Okay. Uh, you've so got first of all, inside. let's go with timeout. T, 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 like the T pocket. Double T? Um, double T. Um... For those that aren't familiar with the GSX line, in terms of where it fits on the tiering, we've got the Hyperlite 2 and the Ultrasonic. Your, 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 you know, your Ultrasonic. Top. Ah, what do they call it now? They change it all the time. Uh, the mock? The mock. There okay, mock. I'm behind Bauer. Got to get caught up. My apologies. <laughs> so you got your top end stuff. And then we talked about the new X5 Pro, which is the second price point. Correct. GSX is? So that first price point uh, available in junior, intermediate, and senior. So the lowest price point when you say first price point. No, we said we'll call it entry price point. Entry price point. Lowest I like means it. it seems like you're not getting a lot, but you're getting a lot of value here. So okay. that's what I really want to kind of dive into. Okay, okay so, so let's behind walk you, beside you, stage left, stage right, GSX, the pad itself. Junior pad specifically looking at here. It's gone through a bit of a redesign, a rejig, because one of the things with the first uh, iteration of the GSX, um, great overall pad, great value. Just found out it was a little bit boxy. The dimensions were just slightly off, so Bauer reset the dimensions on the pad. So we when you say dimensions, you mean like like in terms of sizing, but also sizing, in terms of width relative to height. Width relative to height. That's correct. So right now we are holding a junior large. Um, this is a 10 inch wide pad. This is the junior. Um, again, just its was profile. Was it 10 and a half before? Uh, I believe it was 10 and a half. Okay, continue, we'll continue. Back. I'll stop interrupting. <laughs> Thank you. So, back to, back to the pad. In terms of its overall profile and shape, one of the things, too, was that the, the way the dimension of the pads worked is that the thigh rise was kind of also, like, obnoxiously tall on the pad um, for the older series. So that's been rejigged. The overall measurement and shape of the pad is a little bit more natural, a bit more in line with everything else that we're seeing on the wall. Um, but now your major differences are going to lie when we move on to the back of the pad. So, major, major upgrade. We have Stabila Flex in the price point pad. Boomsies. What? Oh my goodness. Okay. I like. I like. So, very, very stable. Great addition down into that price point pad. 
something that obviously we found into the pro pad, that mid-level pad. Now we're seeing it at this first opening price point. A lot of extra value. They've added a similar version to their grip knee that you found um, in the new X5, uh, as well as the Hyperlite 2. Um, when we get into the actual strapping system itself, uh, we're still continuing on with a similar strapping system that you would have found on the G original GSX or Hyperlite, uh, original Hyperlite as well, just with that full kind of wrap to it. Um, still have our bungee toe tie system down at the bottom. The ability to add a boot strap to the pad as well. Um, flatter boot construction, more in line with the Hyperlite series of pad. Um, no break on the outer roll of the pad itself but we still have some decent flex to the pad once we add it. But we all know that's all. It goes the other way too, like it's supposed to, so it gets out of the way. I would imagine the taller thigh rise on previous models would inhibit young goalies learning to skate. Was quite a bit stiffer. So this has now been softened up a little bit more and this is helping to aid in the mobility of the pad itself. It's got the butterfly assist. Removable. Removable pillow in there. Obviously the stability that you get with the Stabiliflex knee for a young goalie sort of wanting to learn how to skate, but then also get on your knees and, and be able to sort of have a structured pad underneath you. There's a lot to like here. You mentioned a flatter boot on this one compared to... Correct. Once we soften up a little bit more, we still get that same kind of flatter boot-ish style, similar to what you found in the uh, Vapor Series of Pads. Okay, so that's the Junior. Are we going to do the Junior gloves? Well, you might as well Real cover quick. it right now. So the, the news is, is like, this is going to translate all throughout the line. The same basic recipe that we are seeing here goes into the intermediate, goes into the senior. There are some small changes, which we'll cover into a second, but blocker wise, this is one that they didn't have to change too much. They already had a bit of a winning design here. Um, basically, this blocker is based off of like the mock series. Um, so your M5 or your uh, full on mock blocker. Uh, Overall, good balance point, bit of a thicker sidewall, that lower cut cuff that we found again in the Supreme Series. Moving on to the glove. The 590 breakish angle. So here's kind of something that's a little bit interesting. This is actually a bit of a combo of both, like what we'll call the Hyperlite and Mock Series. So you have a mock closure, but you have like a Hyperlite cuff to the glove itself. So let's put it, let's put it on the, the, the more senior size GSX one then, to show that off. Show off its easy closure. This is a fresh glove. We just pulled it out of the back. Very easy to close. That's another thing that they focused on too as well. Um, just coming over from uh, previous year's models, it was a little bit difficult, a little bit clunky. Um, they've really focused on the closure out of the box um, and also featuring uh, their rebound control material too as well, especially for the palm. Rebound control material in yeah. the palm? We don't want that pop right out on you. And what is that material? So it's a softer foam. It's allowing some absorption qualities to the puck. Um, to make sure that you're not having that big giant pop up. You should probably get one of these, Cam, because you never catch anything in the pocket. It might help you. Boom. Okay, onto the pads in the senior size. Okay, so senior pad, once again, exact same setup as we saw that junior pad. Um, what has changed? Obviously, a full 11 inch wide pad. A little bit more rigidity to it when you do get up into that senior size, just based off of like tearing it up throughout the lineup. Um, but overall, exact same recipe here. Mover, removable knee flap, same Stabiliflex knee, um, nice big landing stack. Continuing on with the strapping, which is similar to that, again, 2X Pro, um, even into the Hyperlite um, strapping as well, 3X. Um, same butterfly assist pillow that we find there, so we do see a little bit of combination between that Supreme slash Vapor pad. Removable, as you said. Exactly. But uh, still some great overall flex. So lots of good value here for the price point itself. And that price point is? Because we've talked about this, the price point from top level pro pad is gonna run you over two grand. You get into X5 Pro is like a little over $1,000. Now we're talking about like, do I see 650 on these pads? You see 650. Okay, so what do you get? What are you not getting? Obviously we know what you don't get in terms of compared to a Hyperlite 2. You don't get the Cortex skin mm -hmm. compared to an X5 Pro. Where's the... No Curve X Composite, nothing like that. So we're not getting their, uh, their key taglines for like their carbon composites. Um, like we are getting the Stabiliflex knee, which is again, a great upgrade, but you're not getting that. Again, like you talked about that Cortex skin. The sliding surface itself, because you have that rigidity of the knee, you are definitely getting an upgrade but it's not that same material. It's the same facing material that they use for their pad, which is just a standard Gen Pro. Um, so those are where you're gonna start to see some of those differences. But that said, if you're looking for what would be very close to a high-performing 
close to elite performing pad, but for what would be an opening price point, look no further than the Bauer GSX. I'm thinking this might be a really good association pad. It could be a lot of things. It could be whatever you want it to be. And a glove that even you could catch with. You can give us a call here at 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. One last note. That said, if you're not after the latest and greatest, the old GSX is on sale. You can check it out at thehockeyshop.com. 20 off. Lots of good pricing. That'd be 20%, not $20. Just so you know. Let's wrap it up, Hutch. It's been a rough, rough morning for Cam here. And who am I kidding? It doesn't matter what glove he uses. He can't catch anything. I'm going to take my rocket ship away here now. Rocket ship. I don't know where he came up with rocket ship. Bauer GSX, good stuff. Extreme. Hi. How, how'd, you, how'd you say that so easily when I just basically fumbled all over? Oh, yeah. You know what I, you know what I do? Because he's this, a pro. This is the, you and I no, are just. It, it's a pro in the sense of, of learning what to uh, handle and where you approach it from. GSX, you got to pause after the G and then SX. Because if you try and spit it out all at once, you're going to get sound like me. So it's like shoulder surgery. The, the worst thing in the world is when an athlete has shoulder surgery. You just got to pause there a little bit. Because if you try and say shoulder surgery, it, it comes out all muddied. It, the, the professional part is just learning from your massive mistakes in the past and learning to just put a little pause in there. Our, our new television uh, partner with the, with the Vegas Gold Knights uh, now is Scripps Sports. Try and say Scripps Sports like when you haven't, you're not used to it. Like I was kicking that thing all around. I figured out, just got to take a pause. Scripps Sports, Kevin Woodley, David Hutchison, in goal. This is a good time to announce that in goal magazine We'll be hosting a <laughs> webinar on how to be a sports broadcaster, <laughs> featuring Darren Millard. Awkward pause. I was thinking, we, yeah. like the whole take a breath. I love to learn from you, though. Seriously, take, take a breath, <laughs> like pause. May have me thinking of our time with Pete Fry last weekend at uh, at GPF. Pete does not pause. No, Pete does not pause, but he teaches <laughs> you how to take the proper pauses and how to refocus, how to take a breath, when to take a breath, what to focus on. Uh, so it was really fun being out him out with him in his mindset seminar. And we took it on the ice, Darren. We had Dylan Ferguson out there in his Ottawa Senators gear, Ottawa Senators mask. So an NHL goalie on the ice leading us through these exercises, us leading us through these, you know, reset techniques, hype techniques, focus techniques um, with other goalies ranging from pro to junior to youth and even a beer league dad with his two sons. It was an awesome day with Pete Fry. And uh, there's more of Pete Fry's seminars coming up across the country as well. We had virtual show, virtual guests, uh, sorry, virtual audience on ours as well that we'll be putting up for, for those that bought in. It's, it was just an exciting time, Hutch. It was a fantastic time. And if anybody wants to catch one of the other seminars, you just go to goalieseminars.com. And I expect up there, too, you'll get the recording from the Vancouver seminar in the next week or so, uh, which will be available for people to uh, to look in on. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic day. Just uh, just great to see everybody collaborating together. Uh, Pete sent me a note yesterday. He said uh, the feedback from all the kids was that it was just a remarkable day. The only thing they want to know is when's Woody going to learn how to skate. But uh, other than that, they thought it was fantastic. What's the story there? I'm, I, it's literally what he said. No, Woody, Woody was awesome. Woody was our cameraman on the ice. All I had to do oh, was stand in the I stands. I thought he fell down or something. No, no, he was great, actually. Um, and But Woody was roaming around getting the footage on ice, and uh, I thought it was a really you, cool You day. should have seen us, Darren. We had, like, remote, like, feed, multiple channels moving back and forth from different camera angles, and then took that Ooh. out on the ice with a remote camera feed. So we had one main camera overhead, Hutch running the board, 
and me like one of those IIHF guys that is all dressed in white trying to go all incognito. Oh, and, and Woody, s- we missed our chance. We could have got one of those white painter suits and put you in it for that. It would have been priceless. Yeah, yeah, because I yeah, it would have been better because then my awkward skating wouldn't have stood out so much. People, pe- people couldn't awkward. have seen it. That's no, just now. Me. I'm just self conscious about so it. Hutch- Hutch, you were the switcher in the, in the television business, pressing the buttons to to cut the cameras. Well, and, most, and Woody mostly. was was Woody directing, like well, he's saying two ready on one, take no, one. No, no, we're not nearly that professional. It's no. more like frick and frack. We're sitting behind the desk, and if one of us wasn't fast enough, the other reached across to push a button. <laughs> and uh yeah basically no Backseat and, driving on the switching machine 100 percent on all that stuff that was going on just means there's multiple chances to make mistakes and there certainly were lots of mistakes but we learn every year so it's fun to put these on kind of a, ask you guys a question every time you go through something with pete or ian uh these people that uh, have a wealth of knowledge something generally jumps out at you that may be a tweak maybe uh mind-blowing what did you guys take from uh, the other day in that presentation? Um, I, I had a good one. Uh, Pete posted this on social not long ago, and he was questioning goaltenders that bang their stick on the ice towards the end of a power play. And you really need to have your focus, so you can't be doing that. And I thought, when I first saw it, my gut reaction was, Pete, you're a little bit over the top here. The play's at the other end of the ice. All I'm doing is helping my team. It really can't be that hard. Um, And then he actually got into it a little bit in the discussion as to why he thinks that's important and about some possibilities for the team. Like, why couldn't it just be the backup goalie banging his stick on the boards or something? I mean, there's a lot of people that could fulfill that function. And he said, things happen that suddenly a puck springs loose. You've got a breakaway and your attention has been somewhere else. Yeah, maybe it only happens once a season. But some some of his thinking as to the level of detail towards things that maybe I would be opposed to when I first hear them really got me realizing I've got to have a more open mind towards. Well, and just to be the guy on the switcher board that pulls us out to the wide angle camera here, Hutch, on this philosophy, just for so people are wondering why, why, why wouldn't you want your goalie banging the stick? Well, part of the philosophy is we don't want to be watching the clock. Like, and so if we're training goalies not to be, not to be focused on the clock and how much time is left in the period and things like that, because we're trying to stay in the moment, uh, from a mindset perspective, then all of a sudden telling them they have to look at the clock so that they can keep track of the penalty winding down kind of runs counterintuitive to what you're trying to establish from a mindset. And so it was actually one of the, it was actually one of the junior goalies. I can't remember which one that asked the question, Hey, like I've done a really good job of not looking at the clock. Dylan Ferguson is a pro. You know, there's a, the, Pete shared some text exchanges that they'd had after some of his best games, and he's like, never looked at the clock once, right? Like, because you're focused and you're trying to stay in the moment. You know, oh, there's three minutes left. I just got, like, just that's that gets your mind wandering. And so the junior goalie asked, hey, I'm working on not looking at the clock, but whenever we're on the power play, my job is to look at the clock so that I know when it's winding down so that I can bang my stick. How do I avoid that? And Pete had a really good answer. And I was with Hutch originally thinking like, hey, are we overdoing things here a little bit? But when you get into the mindset and the need for it, um, can't there be other options for teams to to figure it out? So it's not the goalie that's responsible for it. So it was uh, it was that, that was a good one, Hutch. It's a fast, it was a fascinating discussion and one in which Pete changed my mind. I was right with you guys. Like, we're overthinking this that a goalie can't bang a stick at the end of a power play. But yeah, there's, there's how many 13 skaters uh, uh, on the bench uh, uh, waiting for the next shift. They like, come on, like somebody can whack the boards uh, and six, a little six bit. Doesn't coaches, even have to the backup goalie who may not, the backup goalie may not be uh, actually have access to that in, in some of the buildings. So mm, uh, true. a player, a couple of players could do it uh, for sure. Or, or, or the assistant coaches, Aiden Hill, Vegas Gold Knights Stanley Cup champion, he bangs his stick at the end of a power play, and it's really interesting. And I don't know, I've got to talk to him about uh, where this came from, but he does it in a slow uh, cadence to start with like seven seconds to go in the power play, and then it quickens Mm -hmm. to this fast-paced cadence by the time that the penalty, the guy comes out of the penalty box. And it's like, it's almost like a, a, something you'd see in the rink like let's get the like clapping and going 
it, it's really interesting. It, it gives the guys, I guess, the idea that the when the, the guy's actually jumping out of the box. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that done by others before. And I think it's, uh, th- there's another thing psychologically that when, when a sound is very regular, we don't actually, we can tune it out quite easily. Whereas when it changes, like you'll, you'll hear sirens for ambulances, police fire, they change in tone um, and we're better at noticing them. So that might even play into it. I, ch- I should say that Pete did give this young goaltender some advice on speaking to a coach about the situation. Because if you simply think to yourself, well, Pete says this is a good idea. I'm going to stop banging my stick. Well, not only might you upset your your coach, but um, there's an element of self-preservation in doing it, right? I mean, we want our yeah. defensemen to be aware of guys coming out of the box. And if nobody else on the team takes on the responsibility, I would still argue that you need to do it, um, certainly in some situations. But so with, with, with a grain of salt or at least uh, a measure, like Pete giving you the confidence to talk to your coach. Uh, the other piece that was kind of cool from the seminar was him uh, getting Dylan to tell us about a couple of times in junior where he went to his head coach and asked if he could play more and, uh, and how he did that and what is the right approach. Um, he didn't get to play anymore, but uh, I think maybe it earned him a little bit of respect in the way that he conducted himself. Uh, news on Aiden Hill beyond the banging of the stick. Uh, we can uh, bang the drum in uh, congratulations. He gets uh, an extension uh, with the Stanley Cup champions for a couple of years. And there were some question marks whether he would go to free agency and uh, really cash in on it. But this, uh, this is a good deal, actually, I, I think, for both. It's short enough that uh, somebody uh, with his track record and age uh, uh, still has an opportunity for another big deal and really prove himself and, and go that way. And there's some flexibility on, on the team. He gets a big raise, uh, but, uh, but the, the two years is, is kind of a nice little bridge deal for uh, the Stanley Cup championship goal. Well, and, and the range uh, that we've heard reported around is somewhere in the $4.9 million range. So yeah, that's a significant raise, but by paying, paying the, the sort of cash, they, they keep the term down and, at the risk of my goalie union card being taken right out of my pocket as we talk, if I was a general manager, the one thing I'd be aware of with goaltending is is term, just because it's so so volatile. And I, I don't even mean like because goalie performances can be up and down. Like if you think about how good a goalie might fit a team, his style and the way they play, things like that, well, everything changes, right? Like like the the coaches change, the personnel in front of you change, the systems change. The game changes, right? Like the game can change so fast. So avoiding term is never a bad idea in my mind. And if you're Aiden Hill, like you said, Darren, like two years from now, you continue to have this level of success with Vegas. There's going to be a long line of people that want your services. And oh, guess what? We're going to be out of the sort of pandemic payback uh, flat cap world. And there could be a ton more money in the system for a goalie like Aiden Hill. So I- I'm with you. This is a good deal on both sides. And and good for Aiden for maybe recognizing that uh, the grass isn't always greener, even if there might be more green uh, on the other side sometimes. They got a deal done where I wasn't sure one was possible with that with that route and still be able to sign, re-sign uh, Ivan Barbershev. They made a tough decision elsewhere in the lineup, uh, trading Riley Smith. Uh, now we're into an uh, unrestricted free agency window uh, about to open up or may have opened up by the time you listen to this podcast. Uh, not as dramatic as other years, or do we have a potential for a lot of movement still? I, I, I honestly think that every summer is now. It's like I feel like this is three years in a row. I've said it. It's the greatest game of musical chairs you've ever seen, right? Like because every year um, there is so much movement. What one third of the league basically swapped starters last summer. I don't know that the total is going to be this high. Obviously, there's one fewer with Aiden Hill resigning. Some word maybe that Carolina will do the same, bring back the tandem they had last year. But certainly the potential is there for almost a third of the league to switch their starters again. And this is almost becoming an annual thing. And and if more and more GMs go that route I just talked about in terms of avoiding long-term contracts with goaltenders, this is going to continue. And I think the one thing that we got to keep in mind here, as much as we all look at, we talk about chaos Well, we'll look at the big names, maybe, Um, you know, Tristan Jari, does he stay in Pittsburgh? They're having conversations Uh, or does he hit the open market? Aiden Hill's a prime example that maybe the biggest decisions are on the margins, right? Like it's the depth Mm. guys. It's the threes and the fours because they're, they could be the difference. Alex Lyon with the Florida Panthers, right? Like as much as Bob was a story by the end of it, they're not in the playoffs without Alex Lyon. So making the right decisions around the margins 
And it's going to be really interesting this year because I've already talked to some agents uh, and talked to some teams and talked to some goalies about the backup market. And there is this sense that as much as they all got paid a couple of years ago, that might be a position that gets squeezed more than others. And so it'll only, for these guys, it'll be about finding the right fit and the right opportunity so that hopefully there's more cash for them in the system a year from now. So I think you could see a lot of short-term contracts on guys who kind of project as a two, three, guys searching for upside where they could be a one B instead of a two, uh, threes making sure they're going to get an opportunity to play in the NHL. And man, like I just I just don't know how many times we, have, we, we can say it. Like that decision, especially at the three hole, could be the difference between playoffs or not for a lot of teams, getting that one right. Marky guy right now is Connor Hellebeck and what happens with him and the Winnipeg Jets, what direction they go. I've seen a lot of connections to the Boston Bruins, potentially. They've got a Vesna Trophy winner there. Um, you guys are uh, eyes wide, but uh, that's that's been out there, uh, possibly changing things up uh, with, with Boston and uh, whether Swayman goes back to Winnipeg uh, and they do something with with Allmark or wh- whatever, or or the Carolina Hurricanes and and Connor Hellebuck, there's uh, some speculation on that. Uh, but Hellebuck and the contract future with just one year left and whether or not they can afford nine point five has been thrown out there by Hellebuck's agent. Uh, that that's going to make things really difficult uh, for Winnipeg uh, with Hellebuck's age. Or does he have to go? to a team that's ready to win. If it's like, I don't have the answers, but it's going to be a yeah. fascinating couple of days. Cause you're right. Like there are no names at the top of the free agent list that are as big as what might be available in a trade, right? Like, like he, he trumps yeah. all. And could that affect the decision-making of some of these teams? I, I'm fascinated to see where this goes. I, like I said, I don't have the answers, I think backups are going to, and, and three guys are going to get squeezed more. What you'll probably see is a lot more money available in, in the AHL portion of two-way deals to try and attract guys to, to come to your team. Like, hey, maybe there's, there could be an opportunity here. We can't guarantee it, but if you don't make the team, you're gonna, it'll be a one-way and you're, make, you're still making close to a million dollars in the minors. Like those types of enticements are 500K in the minors for, for guys who don't have as much NHL upside. I, I'm fascinated to see where it all goes. And I guess the thing with Hellebuck is we know when the start time is. Well, it's already started. Let's be honest. Half these negotiations are already done. But when the buzzer goes and free agency opens, that game of musical chairs, those seats are going to fill fast. And if you're not confident in your ability to get a Hellebuck or you're not already well down the path of that deal with the Winnipeg Jets, can you afford to wait? And if you're a goalie that needs a chair, man, like I've had a lot of agents tell me they think there are going to be some some significant names that by the end of day one, all the guaranteed chairs are filled and they're going to have to make some hard decisions on where they play next year. The Hall of Fame is uh, more goalie heavy after this year's uh, inductions and uh, naming of the 2023 class. And uh, you saw at the National Hockey League draft uh, a lot of goaltenders uh, present and no first rounders this year but teams loaded up montreal and arizona both took three goaltenders in the same draft three goaltenders each See, three goalies in the hall of fame three goalies per team i think this is how things should be every single year thank you very much thanks for coming to my <laughs> ted talk <laughs> <laughs> well you're under time you kept at the time that's one of the most challenging things with a ted talk is is making sure you're you're under the buzzer but but uh Hutch, like that's a, that's a significant investment. Part of me wonders, do you have enough spots to to for these guys to play when they start uh, turning pro? But there's avenues uh, around that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, as as Woody was saying offline beforehand, uh, they don't all have to be signed. That's one of the things that I don't think everybody is aware of, and I can't even quote them off the top of my head. But the how long your rights stay with the team that drafts you uh, depends on whether you're European NCAA uh, CHL goaltender. And they could presumably spread out when some of these guys would mature and need to be signed. Um, look, if it's the most important position on the team, 
Uh, and if each draft pick is a, a bit of a lottery ticket, then why wouldn't you want to get a few more lottery tickets uh, for a chance to hit big on the most important uh, position? And uh, I mean, look, Montreal is a team, obviously, that uh, needs to develop their goaltending pipeline a little bit. Uh, Arizona needs to develop everything. They're just all prospects, aren't they? Uh, so I, I, I like it. Um, Arizona had a whole lot of picks to choose from. I, I don't know how many picks Montreal had to work with, but uh, uh, it certainly stood out because isn't it most years you're wondering whether a team is taking one goaltender or no goaltender. So uh, I definitely had the text messages going when I saw three uh, go up on the board. Woody, what was your reaction? Well, I was still laughing at uh, how the first goaltender involved in the draft managed to call out <laughs> David Reinbacker's name, Attaboy Carey. I loved how he handled it afterwards, though. He did. He did. handled it so well. I like his yeah. tweet. It was, yeah. it was good. Yeah. He's, yeah. He, he's he's hey, look, good people. Look, he is. And come on, how many of us, honestly, Darren accepted, how many of us could stand up there knowing there's millions of people watching us and not fumble on something. I mean, it's going to happen. And uh, and Kerry is probably not the most confident public speaker, even though he's had lots of opportunities. Look, things happen. Like he handled it so well. The, the dude, uh, he can he can make uh, a mark. Uh, it was at the NHL Awards a couple of years ago, where he had the pocket square. Mm-hmm, Remember mm-hmm, that one? Mm-hmm. And it was uh, uh, a pair of his wife's undies. Mm-hmm. Because he he forgot the pocket square. He, he's he's creative. He he leaves uh, everybody with a, with a chuckle. I, I I always take a cue card up there. If you if you can if you need it, Elena. If you don't, it it doesn't happen. But uh, that that had to be. And you're not just in front of a crowd. You're in front of hockey royalty, like the 32 teams and general managers and everybody. That's intimidating. See, this is why I stumble so often when I'm talking here because I'm talking in front of hockey royalty. I got Darren <laughs> Millard on the other eye. <laughs> <laughs> if he knew he was unsure and they wanted to have a cue card, they could have had a lot of fun. Kerry could have just turned around as he hit the mic and say, okay, guys, which card is it? Hand me one. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Reinbacher is is in good company uh, because the last big famous forget moment at the podium was Bob Clark, I believe, and uh, Claude Giroux. He forgot Giroux. Oh, that's and right. that turned yeah. out, that turned out pretty well. Tall. It did? So if they if they want to go down that path, uh, that's good. Uh, we've got a great feature interview uh, this week uh, with uh, uh, Nicholas Backstrom, uh, the new goalie coach with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, that's presented by Sense Arena, Sense Arena VR. Sense Arena. I'm going to put my little pause in there so that I can say it well. <laughs> they, uh, I, I'm learning from you, Darren. I really love doing this. Um, Sense Arena, as we all know, is an outstanding way to train off the ice to become a better goaltender. At Pete Fry's seminar on the weekend, we mentioned, wouldn't it have been smart of us to bring Sense Arena with us? Colby Hay, goaltender for the Edmonton Oil Kings, had driven down from Kamloops, where he lives, to go to the seminar. He just wanted to improve his skills for the coming season and had seen uh, that the seminar was happening online. He looked at me and he said, well, I've got mine in the car. Why don't I go get it? This is what goaltenders who want to become the best do. They they try and, you know, no stone unturned. And Sense Arena is one way that you can become a better goaltender. It's a great time to try it. We might not have all the access we want on the ice. Maybe you're lucky and you're sitting by a lake up at the family cabin and you still want to get a few reps in. Put on Sense Arena and give it a try. It's a great time to try because they've got a few different packages you can go for. Sure, the pro version is the way to go if you want everything. It's about $49 a month. That's what half you might pay a goalie coach for an hour on the ice. It gives you access for the entire month at $49 or less than that if you buy it annually. You'll get your sleeves that attach them to your goalie gloves for free when you do that. You'll get free shipping. You get access to 60 different drills that are in the system. You get four user accounts. So if you're like the family that came to Pete's seminar on the weekend, two goaltenders, children, one goaltender, dad, you can all get an account to Sense Arena and try it together. Video drills with NHL players, training plans from pro coaches. There is so much there. And if you just want to give it a go, if you already have your Oculus headset because you grabbed it for some other reason, well, you can try it for 10 days for free. Then you can try the starter program, $39 a month. You get 40 drills instead of 60. You get one user account instead of four. 
only a selection of training plans, but it just gives you access to some incredible training guys. So you can just work on those skills 10, 15, 20 minutes a day over the summer so that when tryouts happen in the fall, when you get to training camp, you can really hit the ice flying. Really suggest you give Sense Arena a try. And we're thankful, as always, that they bring our feature interview to us this week. Which is a great uh, segue from a training aide to a trainer in the sense of Nicholas Backstrom of the Columbus Blue Jackets, who joins the organization as the goalie coach, Woody. Yep. Um, Nick's a guy who I got to talk to. He's a fascinating story in his NHL career because not a lot of people remember this, but he played 10 years in Finland before coming over and making his NHL debut. And there was sort of a, there was a little bit of a wave, like European goaltenders weren't getting the shots that they get now to be in the National Hockey League. And I was trying to think, there was another guy in Tampa Bay whose name escapes me right now that was sort of in the same boat. And that same year, there was a couple guys that came over and like 10 years, 28 years old before he made his NHL debut. And he had an immediate impact. Like Nick Backstrom was a Vesna Trophy runner up with the Minnesota Wild. And so um, always enjoyed talking to him when he played. Uh, and just the fact that he's back in the game now with the Columbus Blue Jackets as a goalie coach in the National Hockey League. Uh, you're going to hear it in this interview, his philosophy, his mindset, getting into some of the origins of you know, you know, know, his roots in Finnish goaltending and, and Finnish goalie coaching. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is exciting for, for me to get to reconnect with him, and I think there's a lot of valuable lessons in this interview that our listeners will take away as well. It's the feature interview brought to you by Sensorina, Sensorina VR on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Really excited to welcome to the Ingold Radio podcast for the first time, a guy who I used to annoy with questions all the time in the locker room when he come through Vancouver with the Minnesota Wild, mostly over 10 years in the National Hockey League. Now the goaltending coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets, Nicholas Backstrom. First off, Nick, congratulations on the new job. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's an honor, uh, a lot of excitement, but uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff to work on, but it, it's fun. Okay, so the role, because I knew that you were listed with Columbus over the last couple of years, and they called it a goalie development role in Europe. So before we get into the new job, what what were you doing overseas for the Blue Jackets? And like, how hands-on were you in a coaching capacity after you retired? Uh, when I retired, uh, that's no four seasons ago. So I started right away with, with Columbus. We had our uh, prospect at that time, Daniel Taraso. He played in, in a... Finish in Liga uh, for a team called Burin Asset. So uh, uh, when he was there, it was a lot of hands on. It was easy easy to work with him, and uh, he lived like two two and a half hours from where I live. So we we were able to connect a lot. And uh, after that, he he moved over to North America, and a lot of stuff been going on here. So literally. We, we drafted last summer. We drafted uh, a Russian goalie Sergey Ivanov, but we held the early, so that it's been different with him. And uh, on the development side, I've pretty much been those two. But then it's been a lot of scouting, uh, amateur pro goalies, both in uh, both mostly Europe, but both both North America and Europe. Did you know, like, when you finished playing? Because, you know, you, we, I mentioned the 10 years in the NHL, but what a lot of people may not know, uh, especially the younger generation as they listen, there was 10 years of pro overseas. So, you know, 22 years professional hockey. Did you know right away that you wanted to stay in the game and coaching? And what, what, what drew you to it? Uh, you know, it's a weird feeling when you know when you get towards the end of your career, you, you start to think, what, what's next? What's going on? And, uh, I think it just happened, like Yarmo Kikalana contacted me probably three hours after the last game. We are still pretty much sitting in the locker room talking about the past season with the guys. And uh, for me, it was a really easy decision. I, it's, I think somewhere deep inside, I knew I want to be part of hockey. Uh, but when you play, you're so focused at playing, so you don't really want to take a step ahead and think too much what's going to happen next. You, you're focusing, focusing on your day-to-day, uh, trying to be the uh, best professional you can be. 
But right away when he contacted me, I knew this is something I want to be part of. Uh, so it was easy, easy transition or a quick one. Uh, I don't know, easy, it's a lot of new stuff, but it was a quick one. And I've been enjoying every day. It's uh, hockey is a great sport, great people. And uh, you may miss a lot of stuff, may retire, stop playing, but uh, to be able to be part of hockey and different role is, is just uh, great. So this is probably a question I, I, I asked you. I can't remember if I did for sure, but I'm willing to bet I did over the years as you would come through town. As we saw all these Finnish goalies coming to the National Hockey League and having incredible success, it always bugged me that no one would take a chance and hire a Finnish goalie coach. And now we have two. Like how much, like how much pride, did you take any pride? Did you pay any attention to the fact that you, a guy like UC Parkilla uh, sort of breaks that barrier and gets that first NHL job? Wins the Stanley Cup. Uh, I know Marco Terranius here uh, in Vancouver with got to sort of get to know him and watch him work with the Abbotsford uh, team here in the AHL. Is it about time after all the great Finnish goalies that have been coached by Finnish goalie coaches were finally starting to see that opportunity? Yeah, you know, take it pride for sure. Uh, you, you know the Finnish people, they, it's uh, really the proud people. They're proud of their country and... Uh, you know, it's it's different with NHL. You look back, whereas Finnish goalies, I think, could it be maybe Keeper is the first one who made a breakthrough and opened the door for the rest of one, rest of us. And I think Parkland and Terrenius are the guys who have been now the first guys opening doors for some more coaches. But at the end of the day, you have to realize there's only 30 plus jobs in the league. It's not that many goalie coaches around and there's really good talent, uh, really good coaches around the world. But for sure, back home, there's there's some really good coaches and, uh, you know, every, every organization do what they think is best for them. And, uh, I think, uh, it just, uh, someone had to be the first one and Colorado took, took parking and he's been doing a tremendous job there. I, I should, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention, uh, Yuha Letola, who's in the Calder oh, Cup yeah, final, yeah. final game seven. So I don't want to miss him as well. Um, from a style standpoint, like this is kind of a big question, but your game evolved. In like 22 years, you came up in the mid 90s. The style was completely different, probably changed many times as a pro, and it continues to evolve. Like it's, it seems like there's a constant moving forward with the position. Um, maybe, maybe for starters now, like when, when you look at the styles and how guys play, you know, how do you how do you envision it? What do you, where do you see the game at right now for goaltenders? Oh, you're correct. If I remember my first pro game back home in league, I, it was just stand up. You were getting coaches very really crafty who went down to make a save. Like your pads were probably thirty three inch tall when I retired. It was probably thirty seven, thirty eight, and I didn't pro after that. So you know, the <laughs> game is evolving; it's changing all the time, and. You know, back then it was a lot of small athletic goalies and then it's been size. I think it's, every goal is different. I mean, I feel more it's you have to find a way to get the best out of that goalie. And the game changes. You Usually goalies have been, or goalie coaches have been pretty good at trying to be a step ahead of the scorers. When the goal scorers catches, you have to try to find new ways to stop the puck. And I think it's more, you look at it, Look at the goalies nowadays. For sure, it's size too, but you, you have to be athletic. You have to be good in your feet. And, you know, I don't know how much faster the game can be, but I think it's it's a lot faster since I played in NHL, and that's only, what is it, seven years ago? So, you know, everyone is getting better, but end of the day, you have to be, be a good athlete. And I think uh, reading and understanding the game is too, so you know, know what's going on. I think that's something... That's really, uh, really important. How do you teach that? Because I guess that like at the level you're going to be coaching, you would assume the guys that get there have a good understanding of connecting the patterns, reading the game. And yet for some of the kids that get drafted, even they can look really good technically, but maybe they don't at that highest level. Is it something that can be taught or is it innate? I think it's a little bit both, you know, Sure, it's a lot of in your genes than uh, growing up, but I think it's also something that I think I feel it's a lot of, a lot in the preparation. You know, I should uh, probably easiest for me to talk 
Yeah, I have myself as an example. If I went to a new team, probably less than a week, I, I learned to know where the shooters are going to shoot before they release it. I'm trying to learn all these things and what, what their attributes is, who's, who's a passer, who's going to shoot it. And I think it's, uh, you study the game, you love the game, you're going to understand it more and more. It, it takes time, but it's, it's always good to, always going to pay off too, but because, you know, at the top level, playing against best players, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be easier to read the game at the lower level, for sure. Uh, the defending player is a lot better too at the highest level, but it's, it's a challenge too. It sounds like watching it, like how much, how much did you watch when you played? It sounds like you might, like, did you watch a lot of hockey when you were over here? Cause that's the one thing I've had a couple of coaches lament. Like they feel like kids today maybe don't watch enough hockey to see those patterns and learn some of those things. Yeah. I, I think it was going to be my first home start to be the Minnesota Wild or something like that. But, uh, we play in Colorado Avalanche and Bob Mason, the goalie coach from Minnesota Wild. So he usually, before the game, he, he went through the other team's lineup for the top scorers. And for me, it was pretty much Joe Sackage and uh, could it be Forsberg? And after that, I didn't really know any, any other players. So I, I realized at that point, I got a lot of homework to do. And next time we play them, I probably learned to know half of the players and and it moved on. But yeah, I watch hockey. I watch, it's easy nowadays too. Like you're, you you got all these highlights. You, you see these uh, best clips of clips of different games. So it's it's pretty made pretty easy nowadays to watch games. Uh, you mentioned Bob Mason. Who are some of the other coaching influences that maybe still come out when when Nick Backstrom is on the ice coaching a goalie? Are there little pieces that you've taken from everybody over the years, both back home and and your time in the National Hockey League? Yeah, there's there's a lot of. Uh, I've been fortunate to have really good goalie coaches wherever I've been. It's uh, probably uh, in Oului, Karpatad, Ari Hilli, who's been working with Pekarin and a lot of, lot of uh, young Oulu goalies who are going to break through in the NHL probably pretty soon. Then uh, Sigi Sigale in Calgary, I was only there for six weeks, but uh, I think we clicked right away and we went to know each other. And uh, in the summers back home, I uh, worked on the ice using a video card on it. So there's a lot of different goalie coaches and, uh, you know, I think the best with all of them is that they've been great, great persons too. It's not just about the game. They've been really good persons. That's something I try to be. I was just going to ask you, that was my next one. Um, I tend to focus on the technical just because that's what's easy to see out there sometimes, but how much of the job is the mental, the relationships, the, you know, some people say you're, part-time sports psychologist, but how much is it getting to know your athletes and how do you go about that process of building a relationship in short order? It's, uh, I, I think it's uh, really important. Uh, first, I feel like the coach, uh, he needs, uh, he needs to get the permission to coach from the athlete. Like the athlete has to understand and trust him and you, you have to build, uh, build our relationship. I feel that the goal and the goal coach, that relationship, it's, it's for sure different than, uh, a player head coach, I think with the goalies, it's only two, usually on the team, maybe three. So you get a lot closer, but you, you have to learn to know the goalie. You have to know, learn to know the athlete, what works for him or what doesn't work. And looking back, like talking even to different goalie, goalies, like sometimes, sometimes you, you have these practices and you go out and you post your ass for, for an hour, you're your prim is really bit up tired, but sometimes the best goalie practice could be instead of that hour, just do something. You you take box for twenty minutes and talk about different stuff for forty minutes. It, it depends, and that's where it's really important to learn to know know what works for the for the goalie inside the mask because everyone is different, and that's where it's sort of easier for the goalie coach too. You only have a few few players or. At least you, you focus on as a head coach, it's really hard to get to know really well all the 20, 25 players in the room. How, how important is it to like to work with the coaching staff? I know in Minnesota, obviously, there was a there was a structure in place in front of you as goaltenders. The game has become, as you said, so fast and so much of it is east, west and lateral and so much more difficult for goaltenders. Um, <clears throat> having everyone on the same page in terms of 
I guess predictability is a tough word because it's so dynamic out there and so fast, but at least degrees of predictability in front of the goaltender to be able to not just read off the opponent, but read and trust what's going on in front of him. How, you know, having come up through the Maire system in Minnesota, how important is that type of structure for the goaltender? And can you as a goalie coach, are you involved in those discussions? Like, hey, are we playing to our goalie's strengths if we play this way? Those types of things. Well, it's still, uh, it's still early. I mean, you got a new staff. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I mean, I've been a week here on the job, so I'm, <laughs> I'm flying actually to Columbus or draft and then going to Columbus and probably we, we got time to figure it out. But I think it's uh, it goes hand in hand. It's uh, You always talk about five-man unit, but I feel it's a six-man unit. You have to, the goal is there to help the players and it, it's vice versa. The players are there to help the goalies and uh, the more you can read about each other, the more you could be a step ahead what's going to happen it's going to help it, everyone around there and uh like you said with with uh with jock in, in minnesota like it, it wasn't they always talk that it's just defense or a boring hockey it wasn't that it was really structured we were a team that was really really prepared we knew what the other team is going to try to do and uh we knew what we were going to do and uh preparation it, it's huge it's that's something you have to work on every day to learn to uh, learn to know each other. For for a goalie, like uh, you see a lot of those two one drills in practice, and I feel it's really important that every D takes those really serious because me as a goalie, I try to read and understand what he is capable of or what he is doing. So in the game, I have to think what the D in front of me is doing, not just focus what I'm doing and where the opening is going to be. But there's a, that's just one example. I think there's, there's something you have to work on every day and that more and more it feels like it, it's teamwork. And I've been following the Finnish national team here in Europe a lot and there it's always teamwork. What, what kind of system works good for the goalie? How can we help the goalie to play better? Because it doesn't matter what league, what country you play, you need, you need to have... You need to give your goalie a chance to to be successful. Do you, I mean, in watching that or in having those conversations with those teams, uh, I, I'm just curious, and it may not play much of a role at all, but do you analytics play a role in that at all? Like when you, I mean, we know as a goalie coach, you're able to see what you what your goalie is good at, but does the eye test, does it sometimes help to look at the numbers to sort of figure out where a goalie strengths and weaknesses are? Because sometimes the eye test, the numbers might might surprise us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, now when I'm more on the scouting side, it's more about the analytics. Analytics, and uh, it's it's really interesting. It's uh, uh, I think it's a really helpful tool, and you you have to find the right way to use it. But for sure, it's, it it will support. And uh, there's a lot of lot of things that plays into it, and a lot of things I still have to learn and try to understand how it works and. Uh, there's some things I, I maybe think a bit different about, but I, I think it supports a lot, and I think it's helps. I don't know if it's a shortcut, but it's for sure gives you some perspective. Uh, you could have a uh, your eye test could say that it's really good at this, and then you look at something uh, on the analytics side, and uh, could be completely opposite. So if actually then it makes you go back and watch a video or watch a game and think, uh, oh, now I see it. So it, yeah, it's really helpful. Okay, so I want to rewind a little bit here um, because clearly there's a passion for the position. You play 22 years and you're right back into it and now coming back across to, to, to coach in the NHL. Where did it start for you? Where did, like, like why did goaltending become something that you've now spent most of your life doing? Well, my, uh, my dad played as a goalie until junior A, and uh, my grandfather was a goalie. Uh, he was probably he was at the highest level in, in Finland. I don't know they were not pros back then, but so it's been ever since I've been a little child. I've been going to watch hockey games, and uh, for some reason, he played outside in in the yard or on the street. I was always in the net. It doesn't really matter. So I think it has to do something with the genes, but it. <laughs> like hockey has, hockey has been a really really big part of of the life in our family and uh, uh you know it's it's fun and uh, grateful for that because it's it's a great game and it's uh even if you're not going to turn out to be a pro it's a game really good game to play and you learn a lot not just in the ring but outside the ring too okay so 
quite often we have goalies whose parents were goalies. And the question is always, did dad actually want you to become a goalie? And I know you, you've, you've got two kids. I don't know if they're old enough to be into hockey yet, but did your dad no problem with you being a goalie was happy to see you following his footsteps. Cause we know the pain and the pressure that comes with this position sometimes. Right. And if your kids came to you and said, dad, I want to be a goalie. What's the answer? Uh, to your question, I don't know. Actually, that's a good question. I, I should ask my dad about it, but my younger brother, he was a D, so maybe, I don't know, maybe he said no more goalies. But I know my mom, like you said, with the pressure, mom, mom, mom hated it when I played. She, I don't know if she, she probably watched my last whole game where we played with Calgary in Minnesota because my sister and dad get her in the seat, make, make her watch it, but she couldn't like it. <laughs> It's too much nerves for her, but for me, I, if my kids would, if my son, he's a player. He just started. He's eleven years old. Started two years ago, so he's a little uh, late bloomer or started late. But if he would like to be a goalie, he could be. But he so far he hasn't passed, so I'm fine with that. I'm not going to make him <laughs> to be a goalie. But I understand where you come from. It's uh, probably one of the most I don't know stressful or one of the most like a position in any sports with the biggest, biggest pressure. So, and it's, yeah, sometimes you have to learn to enjoy it too. I was just going to say, so do you have to be cut out? Is that something you look for? Is that something, you know, whether it's on the scouting side, like it feels like to succeed at this position, that has to be something you want as opposed to run away from the pressure of the moment to be the guy, the last line of defense, all those cliches. But if you're not comfortable with it, it's got to be pretty tough as the levels go up and the pressure rises. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, if you look at the scouting side, I think that's the, that's one of the, high, like you said, technical side or this, you can, you can find out, but how we handle press, pressure, how it's, when it really, really matters, how, how someone is going to uh, play at that time. That's, that's the, that's a big question. And, uh, I don't know if anyone has answers for that. That's a, you know, that's really important for a goalie to be able, you look at all the big goalies and it matter the most, they played at their best. And uh, I don't know if there's a secret for that or is it in the genes or what it is, but it's, I, I feel like goalies need, they need a little bit, I don't know, you call it craziness or whatever, but you need a little bit, a little bit that you can handle, handle the pressure different than a lot of other people. Okay, so you start early, and now the 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 other question, because nowadays, of course, doesn't matter where you are, you could have a goalie coach by the time you're eight or nine years old. Um, we've heard a lot about the Finnish model, and and you know, you mentioned Kiprasov. Like, I think he brought more attention to the success of Finnish goaltenders, and and maybe that created more opportunities for Finnish goaltenders in North America. But we've known that the system has been there in place for a long time. So, so when did you when did you go from just a kid playing and learning from dad to Maybe having a goalie coach and starting to—you mentioned stand up as 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 your you know first game as a pro. How did that evolve? When did you get that exposure to the coaching side? Well, I think uh, that's a long time ago too when I started. But if I remember correctly, my dad was first couple of years we was he was with the team. But then I could probably be around nine, ten when we we had a, a goalie coaches. Wow, goalie coach at almost every every practice, and then. I grew up playing for HIFK in Helsinki, and we had a, a what could have thought of be like a head of goal, goaltending for the junior side. So I could could be every every week, or was it almost every second week? We we had like a, a practice just for goalies, where there's um, three or four different age group, but just goalies and shooters. Could almost be every week. We had that. So that was probably until I was uh, uh, 14, 15, maybe, uh, 16, probably. And after that, I got into the, uh, like the high, higher tier or uh, like the group with the uh, Liga team. So at that point, I had twice a week goal, goal sessions. So it's been, it doesn't matter. You go to the ranks around Finland, almost every team has a, a goalie coach at least once a week, maybe more often. I did, uh, I did, uh, for the Finnish Ice Hockey Federation, I was part of their last year. They had a, 
a school for goalie coaches and uh, there were a group of 20 guys, really great guys, but there was the passion and it's from diff- all different level and different problems, but everyone's helping each other working, working together. So it's, it's fun. It's, uh, I, uh, I don't know if you can say that Finns are passionate about goaltending, but they for sure love their goalies here. Well, and, and that was the, I mean, you mentioned 88, like 10 years old, that's 1988. Like, you had a goalie yeah. coach at every practice in 1988. The NHL only had a handful of goalie coaches in 19. 19- I mean, we're not that far removed from, you know, a lot of teams not even having guys in the AHL. So it just sort of goes to show. And I've heard about those, you know, the Nash international or the, the national meetings and everyone comes together and then everyone takes what they've learned and they take it back to their regions and they teach it and it trickles down. It's just, it's such a great model and it has been for so long. Is the roots of it still like, have you seen it change as the game has changed and the techniques has changed? But are the roots like the active hands? Is that still being taught? As we, I, I think of it as a staple of Finnish goalie coaching. Finnish goalies always have good active hands. Is yeah, that a I stereotype? Think I think it's yeah. You're right. You're right about it. I think there were a little. Well, I was gone at that time. I played in North America, but at some point I had a little. I got the feeling I was more about blocking and trying to be big and. Uh, just dropping down on every shot. But I think we've been going back to that, having active hands, using your glove and blocker a lot to help control new rebounds and going back to what, what used to be like a typical Finnish goalie. And, uh, uh, but it's like you said, the game evolves and uh, you have all those seminars, coaches get together and try to find uh, what's the next step. It's always challenging, but I think. Uh, you look at the Finnish goal as you go watch games and you don't know who's in the net. It's somehow, I don't know if it's because I'm from Finland, but somehow you get the feeling that that goal it could be, be from Finland and pretty soon you find out where that that's, uh, that's correct. But it's, you look at every, every one country has a little bit own style. So it, it could be something with the national ladies too. You could watch a goalie and know he's from Finland, but there was a time when I remember you could watch a goalie and know which region from Finland he was because there was enough, <laughs> you you know, whether it was Kipper turning the hand over, there would be different, there are little idiosyncrasies that, that each region sort of had because, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe this has changed, but if I remember one of the things I loved about hearing the way they did it there was everybody came together and shared and then everybody went back to their regions and taught. And then that yeah. trickled down to all the goalie coaches. But there was no mandate. There was no everyone get together and this is how we're going to do it. You need to teach this. There, that individualism still was allowed to thrive within the structure that was was developing. Does that sound right for still how it goes? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And you have to remember, every goal is uh, is different. Everyone sees the game different, uh, different size, uh, all these different things. So you have a, like a sort of plan but you you know you have to be able to understand and read it too and know that you can you don't have to fool it like you you can't try to make everyone play the same way because everyone it's not going to work for everyone but like you said it's everyone is sharing no one's keeping keeping secrets and uh, there is everyone want to learn what, what works where and uh, what doesn't work so it, it's a uh, it's a great, uh, I don't know if you want to say it's a community, but it's almost like that. It's uh, You go to the rink and you talk to our goalie coaches and they'd be always talking, we tried this, it didn't work, or we tried this and uh, it worked. And it's it, it's no secrets on that side. I love it. I love it. Um, Nick, uh, I've taken up more of your time than I planned on. I apologize. It's a bad habit of mine. <laughs> um, get used to it though, buddy. You you have to come through town yeah. here now a couple times a year and I'll be I'll be annoying. Uh, but I really appreciate it. Congratulations on the job. I'm excited to watch. I'm excited to see you and Elvis go to work. And I've heard nothing but incredible things about uh, Tarasov as well. Um, so I'm excited to see you get to work with these guys. And yeah, just congratulations. Really happy for you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's it's fun talk. It's been too long since we talked last time. So. Well, I, uh, like I said, it's going to be shorter between talks next time. <laughs> Twenty-eight, ten years in Europe. That—that's like what Tim Thomas did. I, he spent all those years in Europe and came over from Finland. So maybe that's the the key to success.
I mean, it's just, it's funny. We're not that far removed from that story, right? Like I wrote that story or mm -hmm. was one of many people who wrote those stories at the time. And it feels like a lifetime ago. Like I think a lot of people that watch the league now would be like, like, what do you mean it took 10 years for this top European goaltender to get a yeah. chance over here? But, you know, times, it just goes to show you how quick the evolution is uh, in our game. And we are going to beat the drum of regarding the goalie coach uh, into the Hall of Fame uh, with uh, the suggestion that all three goaltenders, part of the class of 2023, maybe drop that line in and around Hall of Fame week uh, with all the media there or during their speech and really get this thing rolling. And we'll continue to do our part. Uh, one, two, three, Woody, Hutch, and Millard. Um, making some sweet music. Uh, thanks to Cam, uh, thanks to Nicholas, and thanks to you for listening to In Goal Radio, the podcast. 